The one on the extreme right, because I think I'm taking a little bit more time here than I really wanted to, is one that Norm mentioned. Back you had significant flooding here in 1997. Um, Lloyd Axworthy was the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, and uh, he knew about the IJC. This is something that is um, a little bit unfortunate now, because I think the current government doesn't know as much about it, but Lloyd Axworthy did. Huh? That's a very useful thing, I think, is if, if government people in the high, at the highest levels know something about us. We're small and we're buried and our budget is really small. But he knew and he wanted the IJC in particular to come up with some recommendations on how to deal with the flood. So he he had a reference drafted, he gave us the instructions on what to do, we put up put a task force in place and within about a year and a half or two years, the task force completed its work and as Norm indicated, it had significant recommendations on how to deal with flooding and other matters related to flooding in this basin. And um, uh, so I just, I just highlight that. These are some examples. All of these references are public documents that's the other thing about an IJC reference. It is like working in a glass house. The commission it does everything uh, open to the public. Uh, all the meetings that the boards have, all the work that it does, uh, is, is extremely open in terms of its public uh, information and involvement. So very quickly, uh, the, the first foray into this part of the world was in 1948, under a reference given by the governments to monitor developing activities in both the Soros and Red Rivers. The Commission set up a board in 1948 and it reported uh, regularly on those kinds of activities. So that it was not, this was not um, a quasi-judicial thing. There were no structures built that it was monitoring on, but it was a reference to let governments know through the Commission about any issues um, that were developing. So let me give you just one example. In the Poplar Basin in, in Saskatchewan, uh, there was a, a coal fire generating plant being proposed that people downstream were worried would cause pollution. Under that, um, under this general rubric, they came up with an apportionment formula um, that in fact, although it was not favored by anybody, is still being used, although there's <laughs> the apportionment has never been formally agreed to. So kind of interesting. But out of that also came another reference to deal with water quality. So uh, sometimes Unintended things happen that you don't really plan for out of these references. And even though the jurisdictions didn't like any of this stuff, it's amazing that they're still using the IJC guidance uh, today. In the 1960s, the governments gave the Commission a reference to come up with some... There were water quality problems in the Red River. And they asked the Commission to establish water quality objectives at the border um, that, that would be monitored. Those objectives were proposed, the governments accepted them, the Commission established a board, and since about 1967 or something like that, that particular board, the Red River Pollution Board, was in existence and doing all this monitoring. Nutrients were not one of those uh, issues that that board was, uh, was dealing with. The Red River Basin Task Force we've already covered, that was established uh, and disbanded after the report of the flood was, was put out. Then in 2001, pursuant to this International Watershed Initiative and the International Watershed Boards that I mentioned, the IJC combined the top two boards. Uh, the Source Board is off in another area, but the Red River Engineering Board part and the Red River Pollution Board were combined into something called the, the International Red River Board in 2001, and it was given a, a different mandate to take a much broader ecosystem look at what was happening in the Red. And that's the board that I want to provide some information on. Now these I'm going to skip over because everybody has already told you what the nutrient management issue is in this red, so I don't even have to uh, cover this. But one thing that, that struck me, because I don't, I don't fly that often, and this is not a commercial for Air Canada, but I don't know if anybody's been on an Air Canada flight, so I just opened the On, the on Route magazine, and right in the middle are 14 pages uh, promoting Manitoba. Uh, come here. Uh, I won't bore you with all of the things that are said there. There's beautiful pictures. and but, but what I wanted to say was, this is important. If the government of Manitoba is spending money in this magazine to put 14 pages in here, this, this is costing some money. This is a regional and economic issue. And I don't have to tell you that. I'm sure you all know it. But I just thought I would illustrate 
um, all those things that people before me have already been saying. This you've already heard, so I don't need to repeat it. This, this is a multi-jurisdictional problem. And I think, um, Colleen, you said it very well. We all, everybody has to work together. But there's a lot of people, and under what kind of format are we all, are you all going to work together? So the International Red River Board, to its credit, um, took a proposal put together by those jurisdictions, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Manitoba, to deal with nutrient management. And they've come up with a process. Now, I'm not here representing that board, but I think they're doing some very good work. And I, there may be a few people here, I know there's at least one or two that know about it, uh, but not many people may. So I, and the reason I'm doing this is because, I, again, I want to highlight that there's a lot of very good things going on in this part of the world. And then I will explain why I think an IJC reference would make what I call good things better. Uh, I'm not trying to substitute anything, or I, I don't think the IJC should take over anything. It can just improve what is already a good start. Let's put it that way. So, I've already explained the origin of this particular board. It was a combination of two boards that were already in existence for many years. And it was given a specific uh, directive now to not just focus on water quality or water quantity separately. It was much, to take a much more ecosystem approach to things. So it, it, it developed a whole nutrient management strategy approach. Uh, they have a mission. They have guiding principles. Um, and they developed six components that are all being worked on concurrently. The first two that have tick marks beside them um, have been completed. Um, I'm going to run through this quickly because I want to get to the meat of this, which is really why I think a reference and what a reference might actually look like. But I just want to make you aware that this board has got a, a six component strategy. The only comment I'll make, because I think it's germane to what I want to say later, is it's, it's very good, but the board is, is made up of people who work temporarily on these problems. Because they all have day jobs in their agencies. And that's where their allegiances are. That's where their paycheck comes from. That's where they report to. And the bosses want to know, okay, what are you doing on my problem today? Yes, I know you were appointed to an IJC board, and you can do that in the evening or the weekend or when you want to have some time. But I want you to do my job first. That's the problem that people have when they get assigned secondary and tertiary things to do. That's what's happening here. Now, there's a water, there's a water quality committee. Uh, the Canadian co-chair of it is sitting right over there. And um, they've, they've done some very good work. Uh, my, only, my only remark is what, I, is what I've just said. Um, the work is likely to take quite a while. It's not that it's bad, it's just going to take a while. It's, it's very multi-agency. Um, I may have let, left some people out, but, but this, is, this is very good. This is excellent. You have all people from all these different agencies working together. It is, in a way, already under an IJC umbrella, right? Because the, the Water Quality Committee is a committee of a board, and that board is a structure within the IJC rubric. So you might ask, and this, by the way, the, the IJC has a website. All of the boards are represented on the website, and if you want to get information about the board in particular, this initiative, or any of the minutes, or anything, that the, this board is very good in posting things on the website. There's a lot of information about the board and its activities. So let's get, let's get to the heat of the matter here. If I was a Philadelphia lawyer and you were the jury, I'd be trying to convince you of the value of an IJC reference, okay? So... Let me see how well I do or how well I not do it. If you were a Roman emperor, I guess you could go at the end, you could go either he lives or he dies. You, know? you see that movie Gladiator, you know, he goes up or down. Well, I'm not, I'm not here to try to win friends and influence people. I just want to give you some information and that I think may help you think about things maybe in a slightly different way, depending on you know, where you're coming from. All right, so you now know what the IJC is a little bit better. You know what the Boundary Waters Treaty is a little bit better. You know what a reference is. You know what, um, you know what the product of a reference is. You know how it's helped people here. You know the IJC has been successfully involved in this part of the world for a long time. So how can we build on all of that? Well, when I use the word timely, that's where I start to get at the notion of, well, when you put this, almost the same people together from those agencies that I showed you before, 
and you give them instructions and a deadline, and you can throw a little bit more money at it because references typically do come with money that the IJC usually gets from the federal governments. And to some extent, maybe the provinces and the states can pitch some in, but usually not very much. Then you're talking about deadlines, you're talking about people who uh, typically will be allowed to spend a little more time than they otherwise would. Now that doesn't mean that they give up their day jobs, but in my experience, in the 30 odd years working there, if you do this right, then Mr. or Mrs. or Dr. or Miss will then be told by their department head, I want you to spend a little more time on this now that it's a formal IJC reference under the treaty. It carries a certain kind of importance to it than it wouldn't otherwise if it was just an ongoing activity of a board under the IJC. So that's what I mean by timely. In terms of focused, the, the Red River Board and its Water Quality Committee is developing a nutrient management strategy that has a lot of components to it. That's going to take some time. And it, it also isn't clear that the governments see the urgency here. Nor have they really said, nor have they acknowledged, the federal governments, that we want this. The IJC generated it by itself through its own board. And it, it's an important uh, product. Don't get me wrong, but when you have uh, from on high, as well as from below, trying to force a nutrient management issue, then you have an acknowledgement that this is important to, to both governments at the highest levels, because the reference is usually signed by somebody very senior. We used to argue that the reference should be signed by a minister. The problem with getting a reference signed by a minister these days is that that means you're guaranteed money. The governments, for better or for worse, don't seem to have a lot of money for the things that I would like them to have money for. But, be that as it may, it can still be signed by a very high official. Norm was a deputy minister in, in a department here. If we could get a deputy minister or a, an assistant deputy minister and their equivalents in the United States to sign a letter with instructions to do something, that still would have significant authority. So if you're looking at old references that the IJC have and you look at who you know, who signed them. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just the fact that it's focused and the two governments acknowledge that there's an important issue that we want to get a problem solved, I think that's, that's a different, to me it's a different order of magnitude. Again, nothing wrong with, an, with the IJC board and a committee developing this, but you really have what I used to call top down, bottom up. And when you have pressure like that, you're, you're going to get something, you're going to get a better product, I think, but you certainly get it in a more timely and more focused way. The other thing I have up there is cost effective. Well, um, the Red River Board is using money that the IJC has, but not a lot of it. And so any work that they need to get done, like I showed you a report that was done by a consultant called Respect. That money came through the IJC, through the International Watershed Initiative funding that the IJC has over here. But that International Watershed Initiative funding that it has has to be spread over that whole boundary that I showed you. There are all kinds of competing boards that would like 10,000 here and 15,000 there and 20,000 here to do equally good work in all of those watersheds across the country. So each of those boards has to come up and make a case for what it wants. That is the best way to run a railroad, not when you're worried about like Winnipeg, not when you're worried about climate change, not when you, you need some urgency. So a reference would hopefully I say hopefully because you still have to get the money provided by our Treasury Board in particular. But if you, if you had that bottom-up, top-down approach at the same time, I think you have a much better chance of getting more funding available so you could get better and more science put on the problem than what you have now. You'll get, you'll get more than just a nutrient management strategy. That, that would be my, uh, my guess. Community participation, and I put community in quotations because it would involve everybody. Now, that's not to say that people are not being involved now. They are in the Lake Friendly Accord, the Stewardship Alliance, the Lake, all of the, the trust, all of the things, the Red River Basin Commission. They're all excellent institutional arrangements, but they work separately. They may communicate every once in a while, they have conferences and so on, but 
when you have an RJC reference, there are mandated public hearings where transcripts are taken. People testify. People go on the record. It's it's a it's a um, animal of a different order and magnitude based on my experience there. And I think it, again, it would add a slightly more significant order of importance to the problem. And I mean, I don't live in the Lake Winnipeg Basin. You do, and. From what I hear and from what I read, this is a significant problem that demands the kind of uh, attention that I think a, an IJC reference would bring. Uh, we're talking about, and I've, I've highlighted it there, although it doesn't show up too well, but it's in red. This is, this is a transboundary problem. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to emphasize the Article 4 violation issue because I don't want to do that. But in the reference that I drafted, and I drafted several different ones. One took an Article 4 approach and in consulting just informally with people we realized that that's probably not a good way to go because then like I said you're sort of pointing your finger in the eye of people in the United States and saying look you're the problem you gotta fix it. That isn't going to work. So an Article 9 would say look you folks down there have nutrient management problems too. You're starting to develop some really good approaches to dealing with nutrient management. Let's see if we can do this together. We happen to be downstream, you happen to be upstream, but under an Article 9 approach you'd have a, a quite a different way of looking at it and the perception would be much better, in my opinion, than you would if, if you hit, them, hit somebody with an Article 4. So Article 4 is in the draft that I did, but only in a way that it says, look, while you're developing plans, to manage nutrients within this entire basin and recognizing Lake Win Winnipeg is at the downstream end of it, keep in mind Article 4 in order to ensure that it is not violated. That, in my opinion, is a, is a soft way of saying just keep it in mind. In other words, uh, try to do the best job you can at reducing nutrients that flow downstream. We could talk about that a little bit later. I, I'm not saying I was usually the recipient of a reference as a staff person and helping the commissioners deal with it. I helped governments, I gave them some advice on language, but, but there is no perfect way to draft a reference. It's usually a multi-drafting process. And if you've ever drafted anything in any kind of way, you'll know it sometimes takes 15 drafts before you get people to agree. In this particular case, because the states of Minnesota and North Dakota and, and, that, and the province of Manitoba was so intimately involved, people from that jurisdiction would be involved with the governments of Canada and the United States, and those federal, federal jurisdictions would probably bring in people from Environment Canada, at least, and uh, Foreign Affairs, as well as State Department, um, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and I don't know where else, maybe the Corps of Engineers, Department of Interior, so by the time you throw all those people into a drafting exercise, you can imagine it's going to take a while before you might see something that would come out that would be in agreement. Um, but the last thing is what I said before. If you had at the highest level the, the involvement and the commitment and the, and the acknowledgement that this is a problem, I think you would have something better than, than just governments may be throwing a few dollars at, at some of these initiatives uh, as they are now. That's the case I make for an IJC uh, reference. I've already talked to you about uh, the trust that's built up, the work and how people work under these kinds of situations. I think uh, the history of the IJC is such that it would work uh, here as well. Um, I think um, in, before all of you is one of the drafts. I don't know if it's this one, and this is just an excerpt from it. Uh, because a, a, a reference usually has a sort of preamble that indicates sort of what, what's in existence now. But I tried to highlight uh, what a reference might ask the IJC to do uh, in particular. And that's what those one, two, three points are. And you can read them, I won't. This is just my idea. It's a possibility. It's, it's quite simple. And usually references are quite simple in terms of what they ask. The problem is getting the data and information together 
having it analyzed by scientists from all those jurisdictions. So in this case, there probably would be an overarching board or task force or whatever it would be called that would be made up of probably people from the governments of Canada, the United States, Manitoba, North Dakota, and Minnesota. So it might be a 10-person overseeing board. They would have, they would be significantly uh, placed within those governments to have uh, uh, seniority in order to make things happen. They would have uh, staff or know of staff that could be brought to bear and form some of the necessary scientific and other committees. And um, they could be asked to answer those kinds of questions. And while the questions may seem simple and obvious, the answers are not. Because bear in mind, the information comes from all different jurisdictions. It's usually in different formats. Uh, it has to be vetted so that information that comes from North Dakota and Minnesota is looked at and examined by people in Manitoba and vice versa. And it has to be agreed upon and, 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 and utilized. And if certain data is not av available, then new data has to be collected. So one of the challenges is, can you do this in a timely way? One of the criticisms of the IJC that we've heard in recent years is, but it, I, I think, it, well, it's unfair, let's put it that way, is that it takes a long time. Let's face it, a reference depends on how much, like that question three about data, depends on how much data and information there is to analyze. If you, the IJC prides itself, when I was there, and it, it's, uh, hopefully it will always be the case, on being a good scientific body. It, it, it reaches its conclusion based on sound science. And so you need to have that sound scientific base upon which to act. If you don't have good information about a part of the basin or some aspect of the ecosystem simply because it is either it isn't agreeable or it isn't available, you have to do something about it. You may have to go and collect it. Well, one field season may not be enough. Two field seasons may not be enough, but you can't keep doing this forever. So the scientists may need to agree on how much data needs to be collected, who's going to collect it, how much is it going to, all of those things, protocols have to be agreed upon. So that's going to take a couple of years, at least as a minimum. It's unfair to say the IJC takes a long time to do a study. If all that data is there, and it can all be agreed upon, most studies like this could be done in a year or two. And I've, I've seen them done that way. But if you need more data, it is going to take a while. I'm not going to walk, walk through this. You have a... It's just a proposal on my part that our organization is, being, is putting forward to say, you know, think about it. Think about the history of the IJC, think about what a reference is, and think about what it could do to improve what is already going on here. So just in, sort of in conclusion, when you're addressing water quality issues in a transboundary system, and I'm not sure enough people here think about this as a transboundary system, um, it's, it's complex, okay? Um, the nutrient objectives that we're, that we're talking about uh, obtaining and then ultimately putting in place, monitoring, let's say, um, have to be appropriate. So that's why the Red River Board and its Water Quality Committee is justifiably taking its time because there are different ways that you could do this. There are different approaches and so they have to be careful and they have to build up a, a strong foundation of working together and doing it properly. I have no problem with that. My only comment is that a reference, I think, could, could speed it up uh, and also provide funding to do more. Um, and let's face it, uh, as Colleen said, I mean, we're really talking about the activities in a watershed, okay? So, and the last bullet is that everybody has to be engaged. It's not just the farmers that are causing the problem. It's not just industry. It's it's all of us contributing in large ways and, and small ways. And so if you're asking yourself at the end of the day, you know, what can I do about this? I'm just one little person. Well, there are some things you can do. Your be being here is important. Becoming informed, if that's what it is, or staying informed is, is, is vitally important. Then it's a question of, you know, what do you do with this information? Some of you may be busting at the seams to want something to happen. Let me warn you that it takes time. In the water world, it takes sometimes a long time to get to where you want to be. I'll give you one example. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The IJC started studying pollution in the Great Lakes in 1912. The agreement wasn't signed until 60 years later. So uh, hopefully it doesn't take that long if we're going to have something here. But it, it, sometimes it takes a few years. It just doesn't happen overnight. 
You have to monitor what's going on. You have to read. You have to pay attention. Uh, I don't know if this means, you know, listening to the radio, watching the TV, you know, searching the internet, staying in touch with, with politicians or your friends or whatever, but just if you're committed and you want to, then keep, keep on top of it. Participate wherever you can. Come to meetings, join groups, uh, become an advocate for something. Um, then here's where I found, as a recipient of references, where the rubber hits the road. And that's where you, as an individual, either as an individual or part of a group, you can lobby. You lobby your provincial members of parliament, lobby your federal members of parliament, uh, and, and explain why you think whatever is being done, if that's what you think, is not adequate. Say, I learned something new this evening about some organization called the IJC, and why aren't you using it? And, and, and if you use my arguments, your own, uh, if you believe that that's the case, and, and if you don't, still keep on top of the issue, because Lake Winnipeg is an important issue. When I say the enemy is us, that famous Pogo saying is that we all contribute to this problem. Uh, whether you put too much fertilizer on your lawn or whether you, whatever you do, just think about your own activities and you can probably improve what you do. Uh, that wasn't meant to criticize anybody, but just to have a look at you yourself. We all contribute to problems. And then be part of the solution. Uh, work, find something that you think is going to work and then try to make it happen. I think I've taken a lot longer than I intended, so I apologize for that. I hope there's still enough time for the panelists. And if you have any questions, comments, criticism, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much for your attention.